We're in the season of Lent. We're in the season of Lent. A few short days ago, some of us were able to gather here of the evening and to pray together and to share and worship together, to be penitential together, to be marked our foreheads with ashes, the sign of the cross, in the deep remembrance of the reality that reverberates, we are but dust, and to dust we shall return. And today we gather on this, the first Sunday of Lent, and the scripture we hear is Jesus after the wondrous moment of his baptism when he arises from the waters and the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove and a voice is heard to say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We hear that he is out in the wilderness, 40 days, famished, famished, perhaps laid low, and tempted, sorely tempted. We're in the season of Lent, and we have to stop and ask the question, why Lent? Why Lent? Are we not the people of God? who have journeyed this wondrous story to the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection? Are we not a resurrection people? Have we not been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Should we not stand and have the wondrous happy dance of being the children of a new creation? So why Lent? Why Lent? If you'll allow me, what might seem like a bit of a diversion. How many of you have spent any time at all doing the work of sort of digging at your family roots, doing that genealogy stuff, looking back? How many of you? Oh, come on. I know some of us had to do as a project in public school. I'll tell you a whole lot more of the old folks do it now. But digging into our roots, doing the work of genealogy, trying to figure out who we are by knowing where we've come from. It is perhaps the most common hobby of all of them. And in fact, this practice, this habit, this yearning turns up in every civilization in the world. It's something truly, virtually everybody does to try and figure out who they are by where they came from. I've noticed in the news recently two separate occasions, quite startling, quite startling, where people of an age, maturity, have suddenly discovered, because they took the risk of swabbing their gums and sending a Q-tip into a company, to discover, believe it or not, that they were switched at birth. They discovered they're not who they thought they were. Despite the fact that they had lived rich, full, complex, wondrous lives with the assumption from day one till that moment that they knew who they were and nothing had really changed in their experience. They were shocked to discover they were not who they thought they were and were now struggling to adapt to these things. Some of them wanting to take people to court over it. Knowing who we are because of where we come from. There are members of my family and friends that I have who know that they were adopted. And I can tell you, to a person, each of them has had to reflect on their life with the understanding of all that's happened to them and all the wondrous relations they have in life, all those things that they've done to be part and parcel of their home, their family, their community. The fact that they were adopted has created for them a need and a yearning to place that whole reality in the context of other parents. 
and come to know and figure out what that means. But in fact, all of us have spent some kind of time in our lives rooting into the stories of our past, perhaps old photographs, documents, every possible connection, and the wondrous new technology of DNA to try and figure out who we are because of where we have come from. Some of us are actually fearful to know where we've come from. I heard that my family was rife with sheep stealers. Uh, there you go. I won't admit it. I know that there's someone in this congregation who can trace their life directly from generation to generation to generation back to Oliver Cromwell himself. Pretty remarkable. We come to know who we are in very particular ways, not just because of the moments we live, but those that have been lived before us. And as people of faith, that is true too. There are so many wondrous ways and means to grasp onto the past, to come to that knowledge. There's all of the, the records of births and deaths and other great events in our lives. Uh, there's the possibility of talking to the old folks to hear the stories and put them into a context. We have photographs. We have the wonderful technologies that have come from science. But we as a people of God have something more. We have scripture. We have scripture to, to tell us and show us who we are because of where we have come from. If you look into the Bible, both in the what we call the Old Testament and the New, there are all kinds of genealogies. Do you remember the begats? You know, he begat so and so and so and so begat so and so and so and so begat so and so, and it goes on, and our eyes blur and perhaps cross while we try and figure it all out. Those are the sections of Scripture we so often just ignore, but we ought not. And they're there for a reason to show the continuity of the work of God in the people of God. And we learn wondrous things about the promise of the one who would be descended from the king. And the wondrous discovery that so often the people chosen by God to do wondrous and important things that make our story rich as the people of God is not usually the firstborn and the one who's going to inherit the estate whom God calls and wondrous things happen. More than that, the scriptures are full of wondrous human stories. And if we read them and we bring them into ourselves, we see a rich, full, and deep humanity where, in fact, we can find ourselves often. And I can tell you, when that happens for me, almost every time, I'm finding myself connected to the sinners and not the saints. But the stories help us to know who we are. Today, we hear of Jesus in the wilderness, alone and tempted. And we hear another story. It's one that I remember first and making me feel very curious back in Sunday school. It's about the two naked people in the garden caught my attention. That very earliest story about the wondrous making of humanity, the creation story. And in fact, in the, the book of Genesis, there are two directly related stories. The one we heard this morning is the second. The one that's first, you'll know so well. It talks about God creating everything that was made over a day and a day and a day and the last day he made humanity the culmination of all his wondrous creating work he makes humankind and declares it is good 
And so we must know that from the very beginning, folks like us were made by a loving God as the final wondrous first work. And that places us, us in relation to the one who made us. And then the story we hear of Adam and Eve in the garden, an extension of that story, where humanity's at the center of God's wondrous good work. In a paradise and a wondrous place, where everything is there for them, but for one restraint, but for one restraint. Now, I remember every time I think of the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve sowing the, the fig leaves, right? It, in my mind, uh, is it for you the same? I always see it kind of as a cartoon. Those two naked people just in line drawings, uh, everything appropriately hidden. Uh, I, I sometimes think that image comes to mind because we know the story is going to come to children, right? And that's a better way to represent things. We don't want too much nakedness going on. But in fact, I think that image comes to our mind and in fact is presented to our mind this way for a reason and purpose. That kind of artistic, simple reflection of humanity is intentional even for us who are older and grayer, who have love handles and sagging skin those kinds of things. The reason that Adam and Eve are presented so simply is not so they don't look like you or me. It's because they look like all of us and every one of us. No one is left out in that image and in that place and in that moment. The nakedness of Adam and Eve isn't a nakedness of our fear of sexuality. It's our fear of the recognition that what's going on there, in fact, is naked ambition. Where two people have everything, but they'll risk it all for the one thing they were told should not be theirs. Naked ambition is part of the humanity that fills up our story and our history. And it's alive in us today and part of our story today as much as it was in that first moment. And that's why Jesus is in the wilderness. And that's why Jesus is tempted. And that's why we need Lent, that we might be part of the story that takes us from that place to the wondrous joy and the delight of the resurrection life that we are moving towards, even though we know it and see it and live it now. We must come to the story with the fullness of its experience and the fullness of its truth. That ancient story tells us who we are today. And that in the journey of Lent, we follow the one who would meet us in our naked ambitions, and our embarrassments, and in our brokenness, and will lead us from that wilderness to a place where he will suffer so that we might wondrously and joyously rise with him because of him and not because of ourselves. When we come to the resurrection joy and the truth is known and experienced for us that we are indeed washed with the blood of the lamb, we ought not do a happy dance but in joy and wonder and humble awe, stand with the one who was tempted 
yet did not sin. So that we might find the place that God intended for us from the start. Why Lent? So that we might know who we are and stand wondrously in the fullness of that story and stand in wondrous awe and proclaim the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.